And I have the great privilege and honor of chairing this afternoon's session, which will focus on measuring impact of capacity development in migration. How do we measure the impact of capacity development? What are the challenges and lessons learned? And how do we move forward jointly? I welcome you all, and I specifically welcome the distinguished guests and panelists that we have around the table for, for this afternoon. And I'd like to introduce them to you right away. Mr. Hernandez Vasquez is the Subdirector General uh, from the Director General for Migration and Immigration in Costa Rica. Uh, Mr. Vasquez has long standing experience in migration issues, and we're very happy that you could join us this afternoon. Uh, Mr. Slobo Djenuk is the Deputy Director of the Diaspora Relations Bureau in the State Chancellery of the Republic of Moldova. And in his role, he coordinates various initiatives for the capacity development of diaspora communities abroad and plays a key role in developing the public policy framework on diaspora, migration and development in Moldova. Last, but certainly not least, we also have Ms. An Dao Chao, who is the Chief Capacity Development Coordinator uh, at the African Development Institute. The African Development Institute is the African Development Bank's unique shop for capacity development, and Mrs. Dao Chao is in charge of the design of the bank in a wide framework and toolkit for capacity development. But of course, um, among the key guests here is also all of you who sit is here with us today, and we were discussing earlier how uh, rich it is to have this exchange with civil society, um, migrants, uh, governments, and more in uh, participating in this joint reflection around the themes uh, on our agenda today. So I very much hope that after the presentation from our panelists, we'll be able to welcome questions uh, from all of you. Before giving the floor to the first panelist, I would also like to take the opportunity to say a few words on the capacity efforts undertaken by the organization that I represent. For us at Terre des Hommes, it is crucial that all work with migrant children is governed by the Convention on the Rights of the Child. A child is a child, irrespective of the migration, legal or other status. It is not always easy, however, to implement that fully on the ground. And we have observed that many actors involved in migration processes are in fact not sufficiently aware of what the rights of the child actually means for their daily activity. We have noticed such weaknesses in migration authorities, but also in child protection actors when involved in cross-border cases. Moreover, and we've heard a lot of that about that this morning, in many contexts, we see that services for migrant children are also provided by civil society organizations, which might not necessarily have the knowledge and expertise on child rights, or by informal actors, including host communities, who also play a crucial, crucial role and need the right skill set to understand what is at stake. For change to be systemic, capacity development means working with all these actors whose mindsets, behaviors, and attitudes increase the protection of children, or can increase the protection of children. So allow me, before I give the floor to the panelists, to give a few examples of how capacity development work is undertaken at Terre des Hommes. One, during the peak movements along the Western Balkan route in 2016-2017, Terre des Hommes with UNICEF and national partners provided ongoing training and support to frontline workers in Serbia, Slovenia, Croatia on issues such as safeguarding, cultural sensitivity, psychological first aid and more. Another example comes from West Africa where following an assessment of capacity building needs, Terre des Hommes worked together with local child protection authorities to train members of the diaspora to adequately assist and protect children arriving from their country of origin. A third example comes from Asia where we trained 144 members of the law enforcement community in 2016 in dealing with child trafficking cases in child protection and child interviewing techniques. Currently in El Salvador, Terre des Hommes and La Association de la Capacité Capacitation et Investigation para la Salud Mental are starting an initiative to train journalists to adequately report on immigration of children from the country. In Egypt, Terre des Hommes is running a program of social inclusion through sports for children and young people, and we train members of the host community on how to coach children while enhancing their life skills. So these are just a few examples of the way in which 
Terre des Hommes supports capacity development to improve the protection of children in migration. The diversity of such initiatives and the variety of actors involved is both the written richness of the initiatives and the challenge in measuring progress and results. To address the challenges in measuring results, members within Terre des Hommes have developed a general framework of capacity development. The framework includes an extensive list of indicators, breaking down the outcomes in very detailed learning and evaluation questions. There is also an indicator monitoring plan. Important information to measure the indicators is provided by the baseline study. However, these studies are costly and resource intensive. We have also developed 12 data collection tools, including an actor and questionnaire, an actor's questionnaire and a children focus group guide. We seek to ensure that the data we collect is fit for purpose, well protected and secure, easy to be analyzed and used for learning processes. We do this together with the actors involved, including migrant children and their communities. All of this is a learning process and we are progressing. Capacity development is always multidimensional and we understand that to make it right, we have to work in partnership. This year, as many of you and as many of us, we have closely followed the negotiations by states on the Global Compacts for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration. The Initiative for Child Rights in a Global Compact, which brings together 30 civil society organizations and UN agencies and is co-chaired by Terre des Hommes, contributed to the process both of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, as well as to the consultations for the Global Compact on Refugees to advocate jointly for the rights of children. We strongly commend the compact's tasks and are strongly and believe that their adoption and implementation will further enhance the capacity development results at the benefit of children, regardless of their migration status. So on this note, I very much welcome you again and open the floor for Mr. Hernandez Vasquez, who can tell us more on Costa Rica and capacity development initiatives within the migration field. Yeah. Gracias. Muy buenas tardes, estimados y estimadas señores y señoras, representantes de los diferentes países y delegaciones internacionales. Un saludo y agradecimiento a la Organización Internacional para las Migraciones por facilitar esta participación. Costa Rica es un país de origen, tránsito y destino. Somos un país pequeño, compuesto por siete provincias, cuenta con un territorio de 51.100 kilómetros cuadrados. Está ubicado en América Central, limita al norte con Nicaragua, al sur con la República del Panam de Panamá. Y indicarles que el mes pasado nació el costarricense número 5 millones. Históricamente, los flujos migratorios regionales y extrarregionales han, se han convertido en una constante. La naturaleza de los flujos ha evolucionado a lo largo de los años, pasando de refugiados por motivos políticos a migrantes laborales en la década de, de los 90. En la historia más reciente, del 2008, en el territorio nacional, hemos recibido a miles de personas productos de movimientos humanos, masivos desplazamientos y migraciones de importantes proporciones que derivan en soluciones, que derivan de situaciones, perdón, económicas, sociopolíticas, desplazamientos por desastres, entre otros, de todos los países alrededor del mundo. Costa Rica nunca ha podido ser indiferente y ante esta realidad es por ello que aprobamos la última Ley General de Migración y Extranjería en el 2010 y a partir de esta ley Hemos venido generando las condiciones necesarias para articular una gobernanza migratoria que permita, además de un control migratorio óptimo, una verdadera integración de la población migrante, dar servicios migratorios de manera ágil, velar por el respeto de los derechos humanos de las personas que ingresan a nuestro territorio. Contamos con una política migratoria, una política de integración de los migrantes y procedimientos al interno para procurar la protección de los migrantes. 
En procura de brindar un abortaje oportuno e integral en el año 2010, en la fecha de la creación de la ley, creamos también un protocolo para situaciones migratorias especiales, donde se establecen los lineamientos generales en cuanto a los mecanismos de operación institucional que debemos seguir cuando nuestros oficiales identifican a personas o grupos de personas vulnerables. Una vez identificadas, es posible activar esos protocolos con el fin de evitar que las personas en condiciones especiales de vulnerabilidad no sean identificadas como tales y que, por tanto, reciban un trato diferenciado y que, y que, sean, que no sean revictimizadas a partir de la aplicación indiscriminada de procedimientos como la detención, el rechazo, la devolución o la deportación. Nosotros, como Dirección General de Migración, hemos creado un, un equipo especializado de coordinación y asesoría denominado Equipo para Situaciones Migratorias Especiales. Este protocolo de atención a situaciones migratorias especiales tiene como finalidad generar conocimiento y sensibilidad sobre las distintas situaciones migratorias especiales que pueden presentarse, garantizar la identificación de esas situaciones por parte de todos los funcionarios de la Dirección de Migración de Costa Rica, así como su abordaje integral de manera profesional, eficaz y homogénea con absoluto respeto de los derechos humanos. Dentro de estas situaciones que aborda este protocolo están niños o niñas, adolescentes no acompañados o separados de sus padres, niños, niñas y adolescentes acompañados en condición de vulnerabilidad, como embarazo, posibles víctimas de violencia sexual, matrimonio forzoso, tráfico ilícito de migrantes o trata de personas, posibles víctimas de violencia sexual o basada en género, mujeres embarazadas que viajan solas, especialmente adolescentes, náufragos, posibles desplazamientos masivos, población LGTBI y referencias de casos por parte de otras instituciones o cualquier situación migratoria especial de carácter urgente o humanitario. En ese mismo sentido, posteriormente, en el 2013, desarrollamos la Ley contra la Trata y Tráfico de Personas, que a partir de ese año hemos identificado 211 víctimas de trata, las cuales han sido identificadas y recuperadas de ese flagelo gracias a la intervención oportuna de las autoridades y de un equipo de respuesta inmediata y sus mecanismos de detección de víctimas, además de los aportes de las personas identificadas con esta causa de la sociedad civil. Desde finales del 2015, Costa Rica se enfrentó a la llegada de una oleada de más de 27 mil cubanos que pretendían continuar su tránsito hacia el norte, pero permanecieron en nuestro suelo debido al cierre de las fronteras por parte de la República de Nicaragua. El gobierno de la República de Costa Rica dedicó todo su, su esfuerzo por albergar de la manera más responsable y sanitaria a la gran mayoría de cubanos. Para la atención de esta emergencia abrimos 37 albergues, en los cuales se brindó atención médica, servicios básicos de limpieza y aseo personal, protección policial, atención a menores de edad, atención diferenciada para asuntos de género y muchas otras. Se coordinó la salida con vuelos desde Costa Rica hasta México vía aérea, además de trasladarse vía terrestre por El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, para que luego entraran a los Estados Unidos con la aplicación de la ley respectiva. Posteriormente, en el año 2016, se presentó una llegada masiva de migrantes extracontinentales provenientes del continente africano, acompañados por migrantes haitianos. Y a diferencia de las anteriores migraciones, en este caso se presentaba una oleada de migrantes de latitudes muy lejanas, con lenguajes y culturas y formas de vivir diferentes, por lo que el Estado se vio en la necesidad de contratar servicios de intérpretes y traductores para llevar a cabo de la mejor manera estos procesos de atención especializada. Al principio de la llegada masiva de estos migrantes se da un ingreso al país de unas 2.000 personas por día. Sin embargo, dicho tránsito por el territorio nacional ha disminuido. Al día de hoy estamos recibiendo aproximadamente 200 personas extracontinentales por día. Estas dos migraciones masivas nos dieron la enseñanza de mantener abiertos centros de atención temporal de migrantes. Uno funciona en el norte del país y otro funciona en el sur del país para la atención de estos diferentes flujos de migrantes. Por último, hemos desarrollado de esta nueva ley de migración extranjería una política nacional de integración en la sociedad costarricense 
Dentro de la misma se establecen desde campañas de regularización de migrantes sin control policial y en un enfoque de respeto de los derechos humanos hasta el acceso de los migrantes a la educación y a la salud de estas poblaciones. Las anteriores estrategias e implementación de acciones las hemos desarrollado gracias a la contribución de la Oficina del Organismo Internacional de las Migraciones en Costa Rica. Nuestro país, como lo señaló la señora Viceministra de Relaciones Exteriores del de Salvador, es un país que requiere colaboración internacional para la atención de estos flujos. Nosotros hacemos enormes esfuerzos por gestionar la política de migración de la mano con la protección de los derechos humanos de las poblaciones migrantes, así como dentro de los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. En lo que va del año, estamos atendiendo migración sur-sur. Dentro de esas nacionalidades están como solicitantes de refugio 32.243 personas de nacionalidad nicaragüense, 3.228 de nacionalidad venezolana, 1.741 salvadoreñas, entre otras nacionalidades de menor incidencia. Asimismo, en lo que va del año hemos dado atención humanitaria a 6.580 personas que son migrantes extrarregionales provenientes de África y de Asia. Esperaremos que a partir de la aprobación del Pacto Mundial de Migración podamos establecer políticas migratorias más uniformes en el marco de los derechos humanos, con el fin de facilitar y aportar a estas crisis migratorias la responsabilidad de todos. Esperaremos que nuestra experiencia sirva para plantear retos para el desarrollo de políticas internas en los diferentes países para que favorezcan la protección, la atención y la identificación de personas migrantes y su relación con políticas que pongan en funcionamiento los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Mr. Hernández Vázquez. I will now give the floor to Mr. Slobodjenuk. Thank you very much. I would like to start with uh, uh, some words and to say that I'm honored to present and to share with all participants our experience on uh, implementing uh, diaspora policy. First of all, I would like to say that uh, my presentation will be from two perspectives following the holistic approach. Republic of Moldova uh, assimilated experience during the last uh, six years you know, on the field of diaspora policy. That is why at the first stage we face on the challenge to um, create, uh, to generate data about um, diaspora impact. And after that, we started to develop the framework of uh, monitoring and um, evaluation. So first of all, uh, at the beginning, uh, we face on the challenge about institutionalization of the um, operational and the strategic framework. That is why through put it in the, in, into practice um, the whole of the go government approach. That is why two years ago we developed and approved the mechanism of coordination and of the state policy on uh, diaspora migration and development. Why uh, this approach? Because we understand that uh, international organizations and donors, mostly um, the key point is based on uh, migration and development approach. We decided for Republic of Moldova that is more useful and more efficiently to promote and put into the practice diaspora migration and development approach at all levels, through national and uh, local um, in engaging local authorities. Um, the second um, challenge for us was targeted initiatives and programs on diaspora policy. That is why we conceptualized and put it into, into the practice diaspora engagement hub uh, and uh, what is very important that we put into the practice with um, direct partnership with international of, uh, international organization for migration very interesting program as diaspora excellence groups which is targeted for highly skilled migrants which um, have uh, very interesting initiatives 
as an example, we have um, Professor um, Jan Toma, which uh, work at the uh, George Washington University in the United States, which has a very interesting initiative to create a center of biomedicine in the Republic of Moldova. During the last six years, um, diaspora policy framework um, have main pillars. As an example, first of all, is uh, we invest activities on human potential expression of our compatriots. The second one is their civic engagement. Another pillar is um, thematic partnership based on common needs and their professional interests. That is why it's very important for us to invest activities on um, network for knowledge and technology trans transfer uh, into Republic of Moldova as a country of de destination. When I speak technology, I don't mean just advanced and high uh, technology. I mean processes which our compatriots assimilate in the country of destination and which could directly contribute for sustainable development, development of the Republic of Moldova. First of all, as an example, I could give you, uh, we decided to start with social entrepreneurship. Uh, we know that our compatriots have already in uh, this topic uh, experience and we invited them to be more active and to be more engaged in this uh, on a social entrepreneurship. As example, I could uh, uh, give you uh, information that the um, Republic of Moldova is a part of the um, MPF, Mobility Partnership Facility. Uh, and uh, this uh, program is implemented with our uh, partners from uh, Ministry of um, um, Lavoro from Italy and uh, uh, Social Policy from Italy. Uh, this uh, program is uh, supported financially by uh, ICMPD. Um, now I will speak about the indica uh, indicator framework which we developed also in partnership with uh, International Organization for Migration. As early as uh, of 2015, the Republic of Moldova greeted the development by IOM of the Migration Governance Framework, MIGOV, to help countries define what well-managed migration policy would look like at the national level. We appreciated the subconscious development of the migration governance indicators as a very useful tool to assist us in the operation, operationalization of the MIGOV by using a standard set of indicators across 6K policy domains. Moldova then actively appreciated and uh, applying the MGI indicators over two editions of the exercise resulting in the, produce, uh, in the production of two snapshot, snapshot reports. We appreciated the MGI as a tool based on policy in inputs, offering insights on policy le levers that we could use to advance our migration governance. The MGI was beneficial to us as a, a benchmarking framework offering insights on policy measures that we could harness to strengthen migration governance and self-assess uh, assess the comprehensive of our migration policies, as well as to identify gaps and areas that could be strengthened. In particular, the MGI helped us to advance the conversation on migration governance by clarifying what well-governed migration might look like in the context of SDG. Another use we made on the MGI was to guide us in the development of the monitoring and evaluation framework in the field of diaspora migration and development. I will now focus more on the, this MGI-inspired uh, monitoring and evaluation instrument as a tool to inter alia measure the impact of capacity development efforts. In order to establish a part participative monitoring and evaluation policy framework in the field of diaspora migration and development, an assessment of existing national uh, monitoring and evaluation procedures, mechanisms and indicators of impact and progresses. 
including those measuring progress of migration-related SDG targets, has been carried out during 2017. It is worth mentioning, uh, mentioning uh, that in the Republic of Moldova, the first step in nationalizing the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development took place during July 2016, March 2017, by um, first identifying the relevance of Sustainable Development Goals for the national context at the level of goals and targets, and analyzing the level of correlation between the agenda and the national priority policies. Second, adopting, formulating global goals and targets to national needs and priorities, and identifying policy documents that need to be amended in order to reflect SDGs, and defining data ecosystem necessary for SDG monitoring and evaluation. Based on the insights of the SDG nationalization exercise, the Government of Republic of Moldova initiated the development of a new national developing strategy 2030 that is de uh, deemed to be consistent with the long-term frameworks to which the government already committed. In the context of SDG nationalization exercise, a model of the national uh, monitoring and evaluation from framework of uh, diaspora migration and development was conceptualized in close collaboration with relevant public authorities, namely convening on the type of indicators to be used and the frequency of um, their collection, data sources to be used, the roles of participating institutions and the reporting procedures with uh, monitoring and evaluation process to be applied. In this context, a set of 65 indicators, quantitative and qualitative progress and impact has been proposed, which have been selected from the Moldovan strategic and policy framework in force. Responding to the quality criteria recommended by the European Union, the indicators have been integrated in the, into a matrix and grouped by six thematic areas as follows. Migration and development, 20 indicators. Social security and work safety, eight indicators. Diminishing migration flows, 11 indicators. Mini uh, ma migration management services, facilitating reintegration and diaspora enhancement. Reintegration of return migrants and immigrants. Policies and programs framework, civil dialogue with diaspora. The metrics with uh, the indicators has been uh, subject to consultation and uh, validation by members of the interministerial diaspora migration and development uh, working group meetings. The monitoring and evaluation framework for diaspora migration and development field was approved by interministerial committee on April 2018. Uh, enables the government of um, Moldova to monitor and um, evaluate the progress in the mainstreaming process um, uh, to provide the coherent and uh, coordinated evidence-based policy making with the DMD field. The monitoring and evaluation exercise is carried out annually in synergy with the regular reporting uh, procedures of the central public authorities to the state chancellor. Uh, practically, for a public authority which has a DMD-related mandate, it means that when it uh, reports of the implementation of the progress of sectorial strategies and uh, programs to state chancellery, in parallel, the respective institutions present the relevant DMD data to the Diaspora Relations Bureau, which is a coordinator of uh, monitoring and evaluation process, according to our matrix uh, uh, put in the practice. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. And now on to our last speaker, Mrs. Dauso. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today and talk uh, about what is going on in, at the African Development Bank as the first development uh, finance institution of the continent. Indeed, the African Development Bank 
is an institution, you know, gathering 80 countries, including all 54 African countries. And Africa is at the heart of the migration uh, issue currently, as we all know. Um, um, yes, the general public is informed of the numbers for those who cross the Mediterranean day after day. But the number of educated African youth that leave the continent for whom migration is a success goes unnoticed to the general public. It's a loss to investment for the countries. For the countries who sometimes borrow money to construct, to build strong educational systems, higher education to pay for students who finish the cycle and leave the continent is a loss. So Africa, the African Development Bank is um, moving in a, an inclusive development process of, uh, uh, of integrating migration in its development uh, strategies. And this is in alignment with uh, the global uh, goals of the SDGs, Agenda 2063 of the African Union to have a more integrated uh, way of you know, impacting without necessarily going back to the old ways of having one's own flag of this is my achievement, this is my impact, this is what I did. But going beyond that and looking at impact as a shared outcome, a shared from shared goal. So my, my, my short presentation will be around the, the way the African development sees and gets involved more and more in the migration discourse. And uh, from there, we can say that capacity development, be it for migration or for any, actually capacity development cannot be you know, seen as a sectoral capacity development for education, capacity development for migration or whatever. Capacity development is capacity development. Whatever you do, whatever you invest in, in, a, in a development goes to capacity development. It's an enabler in itself. It allows development to better perform. In the context of migration, it, it unlocks um, the, political, the policy, but also the action in the field in many ways. And, uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, when we talk of capacity development in the field of migration, we most of the time align to the funding of sectoral issues, and then we don't go down to the impact level to see how the financing is making the change in terms of the migration, you know, the migration coordination uh, goals that have been set at country level or across countries or in the regions. And um, also the capacity development is not always monetized and uh, it's, it, it, it seems to be overlooked because uh, particularly for us, the development institutions, we want to see the return on investment. But capacity development in itself is the return. You don't expect to monetize it and say that, you know, it's a, 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 the net impact is more than the financial, the money inputted. So we need to also switch our way of considering things. But there are challenges. Uh, in addition to the com complexity of the nature of capacity development, we also need to diversify to diversify the activities to, to targeting the same outcomes at country level or at regional level, but we need to understand the mechanism beyond the change. We cannot just, uh, you know, uh, grant, let's say, X million to a country for a single project, and we sit and we think that we have made a change and we are impacting and we are measuring against the, the, the results set. And this is not, as long as this is not integrated in the, the big picture, we will end up um, maybe talking a lot of what we do more than what we have brought to the change. 
so we need to see that, and particularly in the African context, fragility, fragility of state institutions, the situation of conflict in countries is also an impediment to what uh, the financing of uh, migration related capacity development can bring in the, uh, the, the, the field. And uh, some mechanism to monitoring and evaluating the impact of capacity development is the support to migration mainstreaming. You know, uh, the African Development Bank works with governments, but we all know today that governments by themselves cannot bring much change. They have to partner within the countries with all layers of uh, the society and more and more with the private sector, which brings the money, but also some types of knowledge proper to their uh, business doing, which can be of great help when we look at the inclusiveness of the interest for all to work on the migration front. So investing in knowledge on capacity development is one of the most important steps to uh, setting a, a framework for measuring impact. We need to know before we measure. And when we know, we can plan. And when we plan, we can target better from the activities, and then we can go back to what we were looking for. And uh, was it worth uh, the investment in terms of, not necessarily, like I said, the, the money it brings in, but the change it may brings even culturally, even in terms of individuals' perception. This, this change is substantial in the long run for the migration uh, discourse foster non-traditional measurement methodologies will also be very important and monitoring, for example, cultural attitudes to explore and use and define the change uh, in an empirical way. Um, um, at the African Development Bank, we have some generic high-level consideration for uh, measuring capacity development impact. It is the quality of planning having national plans, like I said, that are in alignment with the commitment and with longer term goals, not just we want to develop uh, you know, the specific skills of our youth and it ends there. That is not going to impact capacity development uh, sustainably. And uh, capacity development also has to be demand driven, but we don't just wait for the countries to, to ask for support in capacity development. We have to find ways to trigger demand and to have it come from them, but also with the, assist, the technical assistance on what does a specific country need to move on and uh, better prepare the youth to integrate the job market, for example. And when knowledge is generated, the initiatives uh, can be, um, can allow regulating demand and and uh, supply for capacity development. But, for example, uh, based on the practice at the African Development Bank, there are some limitations until now because the, our capacity development is broadly measured in terms of institutional development impact, uh, which is quite diffuse, which can be the, re the result of very different articulated activities which have nothing to do with uh, the, capacity, the, 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 the capacity development framework itself. So we need to move on more contributively and see what capacity development contributes actually more than the impact is X, Y, Z and with quantification that is, would look like more of qualitative uh, judgment rather than uh, systematic quantification of an impact as we can do with sectoral programs. And uh, that being said, um, we can still go on by meta-analysis. When you have the uh, a proxies uh, for quantifying change at the institutional level, at individual level, organizational level, systems, you can add, add up and have at the end of the day some impact information that can be further refined. And the African Development Bank, I will move on quickly on this, 
is engaged. And the engagement is actually at senior level with our president, down to the directorate, down to technical level, we are really more and more engaged with uh, the building of an internal working group on migration to better reflect what is going on across institutions around the globe. And uh, our main uh, entry, uh, entry point is through policy knowledge, building policy knowledge and uh, making sure African, African countries um, aware of their developmental goals and the value of the youth, the value of the youth and the human capital development. This is the, you know, the impact of the impact of capacity development for migration is to achieve cap uh, human capital for the youth through five uh, strategic lenses which are set out here, but mainly two prone uh, uh, vision for the capacity development. Um, the Job for Youth in Africa initiative and the Enable Youth and Entrepreneurship programs, which are Africa-wide funding uh, initiatives in support to building skills beyond the theoretical academic trainings that the young people can receive. And to make Africa appear like a good place because the, 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 the young African uh, go by the television, social media, it's a dream. And the dream is taking most of the cream of our youth outside the continent and then it's a loss. But if Africa could be proud of being Africa, showing uh, example of democracy, example of uh, youth-centered, policies to bring the youth at the center of interest. I think the young people will maybe reflect themselves in the future government and uh, take their place instead of turning to the West constantly. So this is mostly where the framework for Afri the African development to impact the change. And uh, we have uh, one specific, these are the numbers, I can jump on them. We have a specific measurement um, uh, portal, which is the index, the young youth employment index, which is uh, trying to collect data to improve um, uh, knowledge and uh, better, better guide programming for specific countries based on the numbers of this index. So these are examples of um, mechanism for trying to, 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 to see how to speak to the impact of capacity development in terms of uh, the question whether it is worth uh, financing initiatives for migration or not, and how we defend the investment, overall investment in each country. There are different components, and feel free to come to me to share on uh, whatever you would like, but we have different entry points, but these, are, these depend on um, the dialogue, regional dialogues that we have. For specific regions in Africa, we have specific needs expressed and specific programs, specific plans for financing, and we have also country level financing. The factors that, in my view, will contribute to measuring capacity investment uh, impact for impact, uh, the approach to be holistic. We have a holistic approach. And uh, we also have um, the, uh, the use of technical assistance as an input to capacity development so that um, at the end of the day, the impact has been monitored and uh, uh, used again for upstream uh, programming. We have internal collaboration, and um, we have also a variety of tools. And in fact, it is part of performance for the African development itself to observe all these measures so that impact monitoring is made part of the business making. And then we place policy dialogue at the highest level, but also participatively. And um, then the final word would be 
to consider impact at uh, not attribution but com contribution level of uh, impact analysis. You can contribute, but you are not attributing your financing to an impact you are observing while we know that impact is shared by all uh, organizations, all institutions in the field. So the, the final word is strengthen partnership, partnership and partnership, and not say we are bringing the money so we are the bosses, no, we bring the money, someone brings the technical, you know, and someone else brings the knowledge and someone else need, brings whatever. But we need to be one core team across the globe to achieve one single impact and not just flag our successes individually. That's my final word. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to the, the panelists. I think we've heard a lot of uh, very inspiring words here um, from um, how, how uh, as a country of origin, transit and destination, uh, you see the potential with the Global Compact of furthering the advancement of human rights in the context of migration to the impressive framework that you've put together in Moldova based on 65 indicators to measure uh, quantitative and qualitative uh, progress and impacts. And last but not least, uh, your words on how capaci capacity development unlocks action in the field and is in fact a return in itself, which we should consider as a shared impact um, requiring the partnerships that we uh, aim to establish also through this discussion. I'm